Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? This presentation is going to be pretty interactive. I like uh, not talking at you the whole time, but talking with you. So it's good to see you guys are um, chiming in there. So on that note, I'm going to jump into my slides. Let me share my screen. So I'm really excited to be back at Cal State Long Beach. I presented at the Duncan Anderson uh, lecture series about seven years ago, Wesley told me. <laughs> it's been a while. So I'm super excited to be back. Um, I've got another presentation and workshop on innovation. And you guys are going to get to participate at the end, coming up with some exciting uh, ways to get around innovation constraints. So um, one of the cartoons that is my absolute favorite from my childhood is the Jetsons. And um, I always thought when I was a kid that by the year 2000, we'd be living in the Jetsons world. But guess what? We're not there yet. Why not? <laughs> so that's what I want to talk about tonight. Um, get into what uh, really drives innovation. So before we get into it, I want to just introduce myself really quickly. Um, Again, I'm Stacy Duckner. Uh, Wesley went into my career a little bit. So I'm a mechanical engineer by background and I've been in manufacturing, product development, as well as uh, business management. So I used to um, help companies set their strategy and come up with breakthroughs and strategic initiatives. But outside of work is what I get excited about. Um, <laughs> In the upper left-hand corner, I was just talking to Wesley about my, my cars. Uh, this one is the 30 Model A Roadster that I built 12 years ago. It's uh, back on the road after a year of rebuild. And um, I raced it back in December for the first time in Riverside. And that race um, went so well that the promoter um, is having it again in April. So if anyone's interested, it's called the Race of Gentlemen. It's April 15th and 16th at Flaybob Airport, which is really cool because you can see all the old planes and some of the hangars are open. And there's music on Friday and Saturday night. So come on down and say hi if you, if you make it. Uh, below that are my cats, um, my little critter people. And then in the middle, just to go along with the theme, I, um, I put together the... Uh, the Space Saucer float and the Anaheim Halloween Parade. The Anaheim Halloween Parade has been going on since the 20s. And every year they bring a new vintage float or, um, or, or different thing back from the old times. And um, the Space Saucer has been around for quite a while and now uh, I'm in charge. So last year I brought together about 15 people to dress like space people. Um, and you know, have a blast at that parade. So if anyone can make it out to that as well and say hi, that would be awesome. On the far right then, uh, I'm really into like automotive art. So in the upper right is actually Drew Carey's Mini Cooper. So when I first moved out here to California about eight years ago, um, I got contracted to do the art in the style of Peter Max. And I did all the layout on it and everything. And even though I could paint, um, I worked with a painter because this was a pretty complicated project uh, to get through. And then below that is some of the automotive painting that I've done. Um, just a little example there of the lettering. Um, it's custom lettering as well as gold leaf. That was the first time I did gold leaf, which was an exciting new medium. So that's just a, a little bit about me. So you know who's, uh, who's talking with you. All right, so to kick this off, let's get interactive. What is innovation to you? How would you define innovation? So um, I've looked this up a lot and come to um, an easy definition. The best way I can describe it is that it's a creative idea with market or social value. So it's not just a creative idea on its own. Innovation has to have that value and that purpose. So um, it's not just you know, something for, for no reason, it has purpose. And I'm trying to advance. There we go. All right, so back to the Jetsons and innovation. So again, I thought when I was a kid that we'd be living in the land of the Jetsons, 
The Jetsons actually, the first seasons were put together in 62 and 63. So they conceived all kinds of innovation that some of which we don't have today and some of which we do. They also aired and made more seasons in the, the mid 80s, 85 to 87. And it was a really cool show that brought our minds into the future. Um, on the lower right is the family. So you've got Rosie, she was a, uh, a robot that did a lot of chores around the house as well as interacted with the family and, and taught the kids. She taught Elroy how to play basketball. <laughs> you've got George Jetson. He's the father um, sitting on the conveyor belt. So they always had a conveyor belt through their house that would bring them through like different automated systems, like um, bring you through the bathroom and it would take you through the shower and a dryer and then brush your teeth and wash your face and all kinds of different things. Then you've got Elroy the son, Judy the daughter and Jane the wife. They lived in a, uh, in a house in Orbit City that was suspended way up on poles. And you can see in the upper right too, the shopping area. Um, so everything was way off of the ground. And on the left, you've got George Jetson on the lower side. He worked for Spacely Space Rockets. And he only worked two hours a day, two days a week. And it was exhausting. <laughs> and his, his boss was always on him. And above that was Cogsley Cogswell. So that was the competitor of Spacely Space Rockets. And they were always trying to get George to come and work for them but he kept going back to Spacely over and over and over. So how close have we come to living like the Jetsons? So um, there's a lot of things we've accomplished so far, finally. Um, in the upper left, you've got a pill cam. So George goes to his doctor and he has problems internally and he prescribes a pill cam to swallow and see what's going on. We, we have those now. <laughs> Below that, we all know the Roomba, right? Back in 62, they conceived the Roomba as well, the automated vacuum cleaner. And they even had a smartwatch below that. So all these things were you know, not new ideas that we have today. In the middle, we've got Jane. Um, she has a projector on her showing her wearing a dress that you know, isn't even in the room. And we have augmented reality now where we have all these mirrors and things where you can see makeup on your face, change your hair color, and do the same things that they were doing back then in the 60s. And then finally, the, the easy one that we're on right now is a video cam. They were doing that again, way back when. So we've come a long way, but we're not completely there yet. Here are some other things that, um, we're not doing, you see Elroy in the lower left, he's got a little jet pack so you can take off and go see friends. Um, I actually have a friend uh, back in Minnesota, Kai Rocketman. Um, he, he created one of these and has had his sons ride them up over the lake back in Minnesota. So it's, it's uh, here and there, there's a little bit of the technology but it's not prevalent. We don't have our kids going to see their neighbors that way. I'm really bummed too that I don't have a flying car to get to work. I really was hoping for that by now. And we could have been drag racing those too. <laughs> um, and then, so somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I, we do not have at least prevalently video watches. So we have smart watches, we can talk through them, things like that. But um, I don't know of any um, prevalent video watches. And then uh, Wesley, if you, I, I don't have my chat up the whole time because uh, then I can't see my slide very well. So if you um, can let me know if anyone's commenting, that'd be great. Awesome. All right. And then uh, George Jetson has his teeth being brushed by an automatic teeth brush, tooth brusher. And that's something, honestly, I would not want. I'd be scared it would scratch my eyes out or something. So maybe that one doesn't have quite the the market value that uh, others of these do. <laughs> and then in the lower right, um, they always had some kind of system and they had multiple different versions of this, but they could basically push a button for what food they wanted and it would shoot out a whole meal or shoot out what they wanted for a snack at the time. Now we do have 3D printing of food, but 
it's slow and it's not going to like immediately shoot out a whole meal and it's not going to look like that real food either. So we're getting close. We're taking steps to get there. But why aren't we there yet? Oh, and the last one, my favorite example is the ejector. So Jane can turn the ejector to toast, records, or husband. <laughs> and her husband's bed will fold up and shoot him out of it. <laughs> now, maybe there's market value there. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe it's more for kids when they don't want to get up for school. <laughs> so again, why aren't we there yet? Let me turn my chat back on. I want to hear from you guys. What do you think constrains innovation? All right. So I did a lot of thinking and research and came up with these categories that I think cover most. And you guys hit um, almost all of them. So risk and fear was one of them you guys came up with. Absolutely. Cloning is a big one that um, is an innovation that there's a lot of risk and fear around, right? Um, people um, are regulating it and, and holding it back for, you know, good reason, maybe. We don't understand it fully. Um, technology, somebody said too. Um, I like to think of the example of, um, of uh, diabetes. The diabetes industry is a fast moving industry, but, and there's a lot of money in it, but we still haven't gotten to the point where um, things are tiny enough to implant, right? We've got uh, insulin sensors and pumps that even a few years back were you know, just fit in your pocket. Now they're about the size of an eraser, but we're still not to the point where electronics are small enough to be able to be implanted and do the sensing. Uh, somebody came up with physics. Thank you so much. Um, the example I like to use here is Star Trek. Back uh, when Star Trek was um, being made, they thought we could dematerialize people, send them somewhere else, and rematerialize their bodies, and they would keep going. Now, I'm not going to say we can't get there someday. I hope that we can. That would be really cool. You know, when you think about it, just 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, and before, there are a lot of things happening today that we never thought could have happened. And here we are. So maybe someday we can beam up Scotty. <laughs> uh, manufacturing. So 3D printing has come a long way, but it's not quite to the point where it's ready to be regularly manufacturing products, right? It's mostly used for prototype yet. Um, we're still constrained on cost and speed. So we can't quite get to where 3D printing is a regular manufacturing process, but I think we're close. I think we'll get there soon. Um, and then capital, the, some of you guys brought up money. Money's a big deal. Um, biodegradables, man, we've had that technology for a long time, but why aren't we using it more? You know, there's just, nobody wants to step up and pay the extra money, whether it be from a business standpoint or a customer standpoint. So that's really held back um, that as, as an innovation. And then business policies as well, right? Back in the 50s, products were made that are still running today. I mean, they were made very high-end, very durable. Um, they ran forever. And after the 50s, really, especially getting into the 80s, products were being engineered to be, um, you know, breaking much more quickly because what is it from a business standpoint if your product lasts forever? So there's policies to um, get into reselling more upgrades over time. And then finally, government regulations. So I have a fun little example on government regulation. So Wesley and I grew up with the VCR, <laughs> the video cassette recorder. So the technology for that was actually came out in 1956. Um, and it was used uh, in the, it was, they were trying to use it in the television industry. And it wasn't quite um, uh, reliable enough. So they kept working on it for quite a while until the mid 60s, they had the first release of a VCR into the market. And the only people who could buy it were very rich or institutions and schools. 
because it just cost way too much. It was a brand new technology. Nobody could afford it. So it was kind of, you know, slow to be adopted. Then in 1975 um, through 78, Sony, JVC and Philips um, made a big splash, tried to launch the VCR again. And at that time, they had gotten the cost down, but the copyright laws held them back. And as actually, you would think it would be the television industry um, slowing it down because they wouldn't want people recording television shows and being able to play them back and fast forward through the commercials, but it was actually the film industry the film industry got um, into some lawsuits trying to trying to stop it. They were threatened by it, which is funny because they ended up benefiting from it more than anything. Um, and it wasn't until 1984 when those battles finally ended and the C Supreme Court ruled in favor of recording television programs. And that's at the time when uh, video rental became huge. There was video stores in every town. I come from a town of 3,000 people. Actually, we didn't even hit 3,000 until I graduated high school, but um, we had a video store in town. Every small town had a video store and grocery stores had video sections. It just took off like mad in the 80s. And um, it wasn't until after the 90s that DVDs finally overtook the market. So this is a good example where there's a lot of constraints, right? Um, government copyright laws, technology cost. There's a lot of things that held this back from a technology that was conceived back in the 50s. So it's crazy how, how slow things can be, right? All right. So we talked about constraints, but now let's see what you guys think helps advance innovation. All right, these are awesome answers. Let me jump ahead and click first. There we go. All right, so if we look at this list again, we got risk and fear, technology, physics, biology, manufacturing, capital, ROI, business policies. They're all the same things as what constrains innovation can also advance innovation. Interesting, hey? So on the risk and fear, like, COVID-19 came up, that was a major risk. And the government poured a lot of money into um, helping out com companies quickly come up with vaccines. Um, I was working at a product development firm at the time um, that developed uh, diagnostic cartridges. So we ended up shifting over a lot of technologies we were working on and adapting them to test for COVID-19. That really, um, that, that risk made a lot of advancements fast. Um, technology, back to the electronics, you know, electronics really hasn't ever had a, a lull or a slowdown. They're constantly iterating and constantly getting better. And because of the electronics industry continuing to move like that, we've had so many products that have been able to be realized simply because the electronics continue to get smaller, better, faster. And we'll continue until hopefully we have a lot of different things that can easily be sensed on stickers or implants or whatever we, we get to. Uh, on the physics and biology side, through the 90s and, and 2000s, the human genome was sequenced completely to where now that we had that whole baseline of the human uh, genome, now the diagnostics industry is, is huge. Um, there's so much new technology coming out of that because we have that baseline and that ability to test um, DNA and understand, uh, understand diseases and things better. On the manufacturing side, this, this area has been really slow, right? You know, we don't, we still, like I said, don't have a lot of 3D printing happening. You know, one of the last booms was really the robotic boom. That's been kind of going on for a long, long time. So if anyone, if anyone uh, has any ideas of how to speed up manufacturing, make it better, faster, cheaper, um, do, do, go do that. <laughs> you might be a millionaire or a trillionaire or a billionaire. Um, Capital and ROI, so money. Uh, Elon Musk made a bunch of money off of PayPal and was able to start SpaceX at that, along with other investors. He wasn't on his own. Um, and business policies again. 
just go back to the biodegradables. So while a lot of the big companies aren't doing it, aren't making it happen, there's a lot of small companies that are using it as a market edge to be able to make a stand and take a business policy on uh, sustainability. And they're getting a lot of customers that way. Um, we've come a long way with that. The same thing for organic foods and, and non-GMO products. So business policies can also drive innovation. And then on the government regulation, I have another fun example. So going back to the automotive side of things, let me just move this. All right. So in the 70s is when the Clean Air Act came about. And at the same time, the EPA was established by the government, the um, Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and they were put in charge of managing the Clean Air Act. And they were to require a 90% reduction in emissions. So in 72, the automotive industry came up with the, um, the recirculation valves in, in cars. And I know I've heard from a lot of people that there's controversy around whether that really did anything or not, or was just a waste of time. But <laughs> that was the, the first step in trying to accomplish the reduced emissions. In 73, then the government and other um, local agencies put more money into um, exclusive bus lanes, uh, carpool lanes, put more money into mass tra transit so that um, we could get more people into, um, into bigger systems. In 1975 then, the first generation of the catalytic converters were built. And that was helping to scrub, that's what we use today, to scrub the emissions and um, turn them into oxygenated uh, uh, molecules instead of um, being uh, uh, having free radicals and things. Also then unleaded gasoline was introduced. Lead was a terrible thing to have in the environment. Lead actually will cause people to be violent. Um, and that was all being put out into the air and landing on the ground. And you know it was, it was everywhere. So we needed to get that out as well. And in the eighties then, we we're finally able to achieve the standards um, using the computer-based catalytic converter. And just a little side note, they did adjust the standard a little bit to reach that, but finally accomplished it. And once you accomplish something, what can you do now? You can hold people to it. So although smog checks are a bit of a pain in the ass, they're a necessary evil. Because back at the beginning of this in the 70s, when this Clean Air, came, Air Act came about, it was actually because of LA, like LA was, a city that everyone could physically see the layer of smog everywhere. And, you know, people were more sick. Um, and it was just uh, very prevalent because of the valley and capturing all that smog. So, you know, often once you can see something, people believe it's real. So this was a good example of government regulations driving innovation. You know, I, I can't imagine we would have gotten to where we're at now with emissions if they hadn't mandated these changes. All right. So we talked a lot about the differences um, between advances and constraints. And again, all these different categories are the same between them. But what's one thing that you can think of that advances innovation that wouldn't necessarily be on the constraint side. So Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. So what does that all mean? Now there's, there's lots of long definitions of it. Um, here's one where the faculty of the mind that forms and manipulates images, propositions, concepts, emotions, sensations, above and beyond, sometimes independently, blah, 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 blah. Long explanation. Let's get into what that really means. So imagination across the cognitive construct um, between reality and altered reality. So if we think about reality, what is reality versus what is altered reality? Imagination is on the altered reality side. Reality is based in experiences, right? We have beliefs because we've experienced things. We have memories because we've experienced things and reflections. So those are all things based in reality. Whereas 
the assumed cognitive constructs are really kind of in between. So emotions, perceptions, and suppositions. Has anybody ever been triggered? Is anyone triggered right now by this presentation? So being triggered is um, taking the stance of emotion where you've experienced something and you have beliefs or memories and reflections of what's happened previously in your reality, but now you're in a new situation. And unless that situation is exactly the same, you really don't know that the same thing is going to happen. But through emotion and perception and supposition, you're taking that reality and projecting what could happen in this new scenario. So you're kind of between that reality and altered reality. Versus on the far right, we've got imagination, right? We've got things that are imagined like fantasy and desire. Um, and these are all alterations of reality. And I wanna get into why it's not just magic. I always thought imagination was magic, but I found out that it's actually not quite as magical as I thought, but that's okay because it gives us all hope. We all have this ability. So um, if we use an example of a unicorn, so some of us do believe unicorns exist, but let's for the sake of this presentation, assume that they didn't ever exist and they're just a figment of somebody's imagination and lots of people wrote about them. <laughs> so um, a unicorn is made up of the, um, the beard of a goat, the feet of an elephant, the head of a stag, the body of a horse. There's different versions of this all, but um, what's happening in our brain is basically we have these neural ensembles. So every time we see something or learn about something and something becomes our reality, um, it's formed into our head as a neural ensemble. And in order to imagine something different, the only way we can do that is by taking those neural ensembles of things based in reality and piecing them together with other thoughts, neural ensembles from our reality into something completely different. So that's why this is an easy example to think about because somebody came up with a unicorn that they knew about horses, they knew about stags, they knew about billy goats, and they knew about elephants and came up with this unicorn. So we all have the ability, uh, unless um, there's some you know, uh, challenge um, or damage, but we all have the ability to imagine and we can all nurture this imagination, right? We can learn more about current realities and learn more about other people's imagined realities Right? Because even learning about fantasy and things is a new reality. It's something you now have known and conceived. Um, so we can all take this and um, put it toward the next workshop. <laughs> so just to bring it back to the Jetsons, remember way back in 1962, came up with this cartoon that um, lots of innovation has happened today. Somebody imagined all these different things way back then, but they came across constraints as well as advancements that have gotten us there or not. So it's pretty cool to um, finally be in the, you know, getting closer to the age of the Jetsons. I hope soon we have flying cars because that's my dream It's to get to work very quickly in a flying car. Uh, in the meantime, I'll just work from home some more. <laughs> All right, so up next, you guys get to participate and share your imagination and work through some constraints and come up with things that will help advance innovation. Guys, these are, have been amazing, really great ideas, really great thoughts. And, um, you know, when, when you think about the brain, um, have you ever heard the analogy that the brain is like a rubber band and every time you overstretch it, you know, you can always stretch it in its normal realm and it, it'll retract normally. But when you overstretch it, when you take it a little bit further, it never retracts all the way. You've always overstretched it. So you're doing the same thing with your brain when you take on exercises outside of the norm. So in doing this, now we've created 
some new realities, right? We've taken those same neural constructs that we had, um, ideas of our current realities and translated them into these new imagined ideas that now the next time you go and try to think up of a solution, you're going to remember these new realities and be able to come up with additional ideas. So I hope you guys all enjoyed this. Um, I would love to hear feedback. Wesley told me that you guys each write paper, a paper on this, so <laughs> he'll maybe share them with me this time. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.